So here we are in finishing um, Paul's letter that he wrote to the Colossians. And in, in this letter, if you reflect back on what we talked about in part one, uh, Paul had some, some really great words of encouragement and um, deep words of love for the, those believers who he spent time with, that he saw many of them come to know Christ and live their lives for Christ. But then he also had some words of admonishment because there were those who weren't continuing to live in Christ. Just as today, uh, and all through ever since um, the early church, um, many will fall away. Many will go their own way. Many will follow the way of uh, the Nicolaitans or um, we'll, we'll find another way to go ahead uh, and live. And, and Jesus mentioned that, that, that I am the way, but many will follow another path. And so they were already doing that in uh, law. And so Paul wrote this in around 62 AD. Um, we know that this wasn't his last letters. There's several letters that we're going to be covering after this. But um, now he's he's still in prison in his, in his own hired house. So he's not a, a captive, but uh, he is in captivity because he's waiting uh, he appealed to Caesar, he's in Rome, and eventually uh, to Caesar he will go, was, was what was told to him. So we'll start right off in chapter 3. It says, therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, drive for the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And it's interesting as I read this, strive, Paul's saying, strive, that means be diligent, work hard for, uh, strain for the things above, not on the things of this world. And can you remember when uh, Jesus was talking about that press God for your, all of your needs? Don't worry about your needs because the Gentiles, uh, the people of this world, drive to attain those things. Well, here Paul's saying that we need to strive instead of the things of this world, the things that we think we need. We need to strive for the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then he clearly says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And sometimes we become preoccupied with things in this world. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure that Paul was, you know, a participant of lots of events, and he even said that. So that wasn't the issue. It's when people lose their lives in this world, they no longer have a life that they're living for Christ. He says, don't do that. Keep your minds set on the things above, not on the earthly things. Why? Because you died. You surrendered your life. You decided to follow Jesus. So you lost your life in this world for Christ's sake. And so your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And we know that Paul wrote in other places, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So will we live our lives for Christ. And when Christ, who is your life? What a beautiful, small sentence. When, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, the components of your earthly nature. It's our nature to sin. And Paul knew that. And he just put those things aside. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Anytime we want more, that's idolatry. We should want more of the things above is what Paul's saying. We shouldn't want more of what this world has. How many times do you see these televangelists saying, I want more because God wants us to be blessed with the things of this world? I don't know what they're reading or what they're listening to, but it's not Christ. And it's definitely not what Paul was writing. And so he said, free yourself of this stuff. Because of these things, because of this mindset, because of these sins, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. And, and we, parallels to this, we've been speaking about um, the end of times, which a lot of people are feeling as though we're racing towards that. 
and whether we are or not, truth be told, even now, Paul's writing, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. When you lived among them, when you were a participant or a practicer of the worldly life, he says, when you lived among them, you also used to walk in these ways. We all did. Before we knew Christ, we all walked in these ways. But now, you must put aside all such things as these. Anger. You could become angry, but some people just walk around angry all the time. Rage. Having to lash out. If you've been watching the news lately, you see tons of rage because it's it's a product of anger. Malice. Slander. People talking about other people, not even the truth, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to one another, since you are taken off the old self with his practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, that we are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, or we're not. It depends where our minds are at, where our heart is at. That's what Paul is telling them. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, man, woman. Christ is in all. And he is all. Therefore, as the elect of God, as we have been elected by God, Holy and beloved, hold yourselves with hearts of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive any complaint you may have against someone else. Not so easy to do. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So we all know that Christ forgave us of all of our trespasses unconditionally upon our full surrender. He says, forgive as the Lord forgave you unconditionally. And over all these virtues, put on love. This is speaking about something that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a spiritual heavenly love, which is the bond It's perfect unity. So when we see people who can't get along, who aren't united, it's because they don't live according to the bond of love from Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. For to this, you are called as members of one body. We belong to that body if we are in Christ. And be thankful. I mean, that's simple. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Then he's addressing issues, of course, that were happening with those who were in Corinth. He said, wives, you need to submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, you need to love your wives. Don't don't be hard with them. And children, obey your parents in everything. For this is pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, Don't provoke your children so that they won't become discouraged. Slaves, if you are a slave, obey your earthly master in everything. Not only to please them while they're watching you, but with sincerity of heart and fear of the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with your whole being. For the Lord and not for men. You're working for the Lord and not for men, because you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. So why seek a reward here in this world? 
It is the Lord Christ you're serving. If indeed you are serving the Lord, whoever does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. And there is no favoritism with God. He has no favorites. He loves everyone equally. And finally, he writes, masters, if you're a master of a slave, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful, knowing that Christ could return at any time, and being thankful. As you pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may declare it clearly, as I should. Act wisely towards outsiders, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. That means capitalizing on the moments. Don't act like the world, but be the salt. Be the light in this world. Act wisely towards outsiders. Those outside of Christ, Paul's talking about. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. If you're seeking others graciously and in love, the Holy Spirit is reigning in your life. If the Holy Spirit's reigning in your life, then the Spirit will speak whatever needs to be spoken to all people. Tychius will tell you all the news about me. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about us, and that he may be an encouragement to your hearts. With him, I am sending um, on the, on the sis, on simus, other our other faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. Now, I thought about that. Who is one of you? Meaning he is a fellow follower of Jesus. He's one of you. They will tell you about everything here. My fellow prisoner, Articus, sends you greetings. As does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Now, you have already received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, not Jesus Christ, our Christ, our Lord, but Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greeting. These are only uh, the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. So he's saying that the rest were all Gentiles. And they have been a comfort to me. The profess. One of you, meaning a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. He is also wrestling in prayer for you so that you may stand mature and fully assured in the full will of God. For I testify about him that he goes to great pains for you and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke the beloved physician, we know that he was the author of the Gospel of Luke, and he authored uh, the book called Acts. And Demas, send your, your greetings also. So we know that they were there with him in Rome. Greet the brothers in Laodicea, as well as uh, Nympia and the church that meets at her house. So there was an actual um, home church, as they would call it, and of course, most of the time, that's where they met back then. And after this letter has been read among you, so take it, read it, let everybody among you read it, make sure that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. We don't know that letter because we don't have it, but of course, Paul knew about it, and Paul said for them to read it. So, uh, Acrippus, See to it that you complete the ministry that you have received in the Lord. This greeting is in my own hand. So Paul's saying, I wrote this myself. 
Remember my chains, everybody. Grace be with you. And that was Paul's letter, the, the second part of his letter to the believers who were in Colossae. And he had good things to say, and he had, uh, uh, once again, he had teaching and admonishment that were taking place in his own handwritten letter that he wrote to them. Those same words speak to us nearly 2,000 years later, just as though he was writing them. So we praise God for this, and that, that concludes part two, Paul's letter to the Colossians.